Okay, guys, uh, let us begin. Um, so today we are doing a tutorial on uh, special inclusions and exempt income, right? Um, the tutorial, oh, wow. Well, firstly, you guys covered, if you still recall, you first did the text in context uh, learning area, right? And then you were lectured by Prof. P. Dark on residency, if you still remember. Um, and gross income and now today I'm essentially tutoring you on stuff that was lectured by Mr. Lungelo Mutamai which was the special inclusions and exempt income right um, so guys basically my job is basically like this I, I think it's better to essentially make you understand what's the point of all of attending tarts essentially right so you don't have unreasonable expectations I'm not here to re-lecture you guys. My job is to, is, is to essentially um, carry on from where the lecturers uh, stopped. So if you attended lectures, the only thing you literally get out of a lecture is you'll know which uh, or what is the relevant theory to study. But remember, your objective is to score marks. Like, that's what you are here to do, guys. Well, that's the only way you progress if you are if you want to go to third year. You can only progress to third year or to Bell 300 if you manage to score at least 50% on, well, not on each, but on average, on each, on average, on each assess assessment you write this year. So if you cannot um, get um, at least 50% this year, then you won't pass. So if you can manage your life and your study methods and your efforts, in that vein like you must know okay my objective is to make sure i earn at least at the very minimum 50 percent on each assi assessment i write this year and then you'll make it right so what this means is this if you've been attending lectures very well that doesn't guarantee you a pass unfortunately because the lectures only give you one aspect of the um, puzzle which is only the theory aspect right and then your job well my job is to then teach you or first take you through how the theory which you've acquired in class is applied in case studies or in assessments. And then your job is to go on further and learn how to apply the theory you've essentially learned in class and you've also, and you've also learned on your own, right? So my job is to take you on the, or is to bridge, I'm essentially the bridge between the theory and the application of that theory, right? So, guys, in a nutshell, I'm here to teach you how to score marks, which is what essentially is your business. I don't care if you're a good person. I don't care if uh, you are a good student, you attend every lecture, but if you cannot score at least 50% on a paper you'll be writing this year, then you won't pass. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but um, some people, when you talk to them, they understand the, the material or the theory. But when it comes to answering questions, unfortunately, they fail. They cannot score marks, right? And that's my job. My job is to teach you guys this is how you earn marks in Bell 200. So, beginning with the, so going into the question, guys, I always state this. Always, the ill usually be there where I've highlighted it pink. Ill always be there. Always take note of the mark allocation and the time allocation, right? That's the first thing. In other words, you should know, okay, what's the maximum I can score in this question and how much time do I have? Meaning, if you run out of time, it must be ingrained in you to move on to the next question immediately. If the question said do it in 15 minutes, then move on to the next question as soon as the 15 minutes is over, right? And then um, the next thing, it may seem a bit illogical, but the next thing you should do is, is to always read the required of the question. What this does is it gives you pebbles. It anchors you as to, okay, this is what I'm required to do. It tells you what you need to do in order to score the marks on the question. In this question, in order to score marks, you are required to calculate using the normal tax liability framework, right? The total amount to be included in Tato Mabana's income. So we are calculating Tato Mabana's income for her 2023 year of assessment. And further, they require us to give brief reasons for all inclusions and nil effects, right? So we must give reasons for all inclusions and nil effects. And also we must show considerations for possible exemptions, right? So this is what you need to do in order to score the maximum marks this question um, is out of, right? Um, 
whilst I'm here, I want to highlight something. You notice there it says, first of all, it says using the normal tax liability framework. Guys, this is, this is last year's textbook, but uh, nothing, it hasn't really changed that much. So, um, I just want to quickly show you the normal tax liability framework. I think maybe it's, yeah, this is it. Guys, this is the normal tax liability framework, right? If you notice there, it says calculate Tato Mabana's income. Did you pick that up, right? What this means is when you are doing the question, you must determine, you must first determine your gross income and then you determine the exemptions. And remember, in gross income, we also have special inclusions into gross income. If you haven't figured it out yet, know this, guys. In order for an amount or for a line item or for a transaction to be gross income, it must first meet the special inclusions, right? Meaning if it meets the special inclusions, any of the special inclusions, paragraphs or provisions, you don't have to go through the definition. You understand? And then if it doesn't meet any of those um, special inclusions, provisions, that's when you take it through the general definition of gross income, which was lectured by Professor Pidak. So it may seem a little bit weird because you were first lectured by Professor Pidak and then you were lectured by Mr. Mutsamai. So you may think the general definition takes precedence. But what takes precedence first is the special provisions. And then if a transaction doesn't meet any of those special provisions or special inclusions, then you uh, apply the general definition of gross income and then if it doesn't meet those, then you know it's not gross income. And then after that, after you've determined your gross income, you list the exempt income or you deduct the exempt income and that will give you your income. What this means, guys, in terms of this question, notice it says calculate Tato Mabana's income. If maybe in this question to throw you off, we also gave you some deductions and we also gave you some um, taxable capital gains. What this means is this, if you didn't stop here and you continued and you uh, factor in those deductions and those taxable income, uh, taxable capital gains, you are wasting time because it will only mark you from gross income up until income. You understand? So, if the question says another time or some other time, the question might say calculate the taxable income, right? And then that means you can calculate up until this line item right here. Underlay, underlay, guys. Sure, sure. Um, you may calculate up until the total taxable income, right? And if you continue thereafter and you, use, you apply the, the normal tax tables, you are wasting time because the required only says calculate so-and-so's taxable income. Right, okay. Uh, okay, now you know the framework and you also know like, okay, how it relates to when they say calculate income or they say calculate uh, taxable income or they say calculate the normal tax payable or receivable by the taxpayer. Okay, now let's go into the question. Okay, I will read a line item and then we'll deal with its tax uh, implications so that we, I don't first read it and then we have to reread it again, right? To save time, essentially. So we know, since we've read the required, that we are dealing with a taxpayer called Tato Mabana, who is, 65 year, who is a 65-year-old South African resident. And you should know by now, that thing, okay, maybe I should do it like this, actually. So she's 65 years old. You should know by now, in things like interest exemptions, they are applied based on age, right? Things like a, a taxpayer's rebate or thing, you have not really dealt with it in detail, but they are based on, on, on a taxpayer's age. So you should know, whenever you say a taxpayer's age, that's really important information, because it has a lot of um, uh, tax implications. But another thing is there is that, as you were taught by Professor P. Duck, it's very important to know whether or not a taxpayer is a resident or non-resident because if they are a resident, then they are taxed on their worldwide income. However, if they are a non-resident, then they'll only be taxed on, um, on income from a source within South Africa. If I'm speaking too fast, guys, please just raise a hand. Or if you don't understand something, please just raise a hand. Don't be shy. Okay, so we are told that uh, Tatum Abana, 65-year-old South African resident, is employed at Tulani Traders, um, in brackets, Tulani. She has a daughter, Miriam, who's 30 years old. So, another information there. She has a daughter, Miriam, who is 30 years old. Maybe you might want to use a different highlighter for that because it's a different taxpayer, right? And we are told that Miriam was in a serious car accident and is, and is now considered disabled. So you might highlight that as well, that Miriam is disabled. Right, and then we are told that Tato started working at Tulani on 1 December 2021. 
her salary per month then was 24,000 rands. Guys, when you, if you are really prepared for a test, when you say information like this, in your mind, you might start to anticipate certain things. What do you think you might anticipate on based on this information? That uh, Tato started working um, at Tulani. Okay, started working on 1 December 2021. And then they give us a salary per month, which was 24,000 rands. What do you think you might start anticipating based on that? Don't be sh Yes, sir. Anticipating bursaries. Bursaries, right. And uh, specifically, you might even have to determine the remuneration proxy, right? Yeah, that's very correct. And then um, we are told that during a 2023 year of assessment, Tato receives the following amounts uh, from Tulani. And you already know as per the required, this is relevant information because you are required to determine Tato Mamabana's income for the 2023 year of assessment and not any other year of assessment. So Tato got a salary, salary of 25,000 rands. Is that gross income? Hey yeah, guys, I'm asking. Is it gross income? Uh, okay, and then give a reason. Why do you why do you think it's gross income? Don't be shy, guys. You know this. It's services rendered, right? Remember, a salary does meet uh, the um, salary is not capital in nature. It does meet the general definition of gross income, right? But there's already a special or specific provision for it, which is services rendered. So as for your reason, you cannot say general definition of gross income. You must take the one that takes precedence, which is paragraph C, and that service is rendered. Do you guys agree? Okay. And then I want, yeah, another thing, guys, it's this. Guys, please make sure you uh, show your calculations, right? And it was for 12 months, as you've, as you've seen. So in this, in this part, you'll first get half a mark for essentially stating the reason that it services it's enough right is it bold enough for you guys okay cool the first half a mark would be for the reason which is services rendered right and then the second one mark will be for essentially showing your calculation that is 25,000 multiplied by 12 right so Please make it a habit. Make it a habit to always show your calculations and not just write the final amounts because in tax, we essentially mark your logic or how you thought about the question, not necessarily the final mark. So if, let's say, you made a mistake and you said, okay, since you saw, since you saw that she started working at 1 December 2021, you maybe took it as 1 December 2022 and you multiplied the salary by 3 and you essentially got... Uh, you insert it only got 75,000. If you just write it there as 75,000, you'll only get 0 0.5 for the reason, and you won't get the other half a mark for the 25,000 because it didn't show your calculation. But if you show your calculation, even though the final amount is wrong, we'll give you half a mark for the reason which says service is rendered, and we'll give you another half a mark for the 25,000, and you'll just lose a half a mark for the months which are wrong, which should have been 12 instead of three. Do you guys understand? So please make it a habit to show your calculations because that way you increase your chances of earning more marks even though your final amounts are wrong. Okay. Is the salary exempt? It's not, right? Um, okay, we move on. She received a payment of 15,000 rands, right? So payment of 15,000 rands. For excellence in clan relations, Tato did not expect to receive any such payment. So essentially, it's a bonus. So we include the bonus services rendered still, right? Because if she was not rendering a service or if she was not employed at Tulani, then she would never have received that amount. And it's not exempt, you guys agree, right? And then we move on. Like um, he said, we are anticipating bursaries. Then a bursary of 50,000 rands for Miriam to study. So it's for Miriam. Again, whenever you see Miriam, you remind yourself it's a different taxpayer. For Miriam to study a diploma at a recognized institution. Right, so it's at a recognized institution. Maybe we might put that in blue. At NQF level 4. 
is this gross income? Yeah? Why? Okay, in terms of what? Give the reason. What's the reason? I agree it is gross income. It's services rendered, right? Again, because she is employed at Tulani. If she was not an employee, if Tato, oh yeah, an interesting question. Do we include the 50,000 rents in Tato Mabana's gross income or gross income? Or do we include it in Miriam's gross income? What do you guys think? Remember, the person receiving the benefit to study is Miriam, who is a daughter of Tato, and our job is to determine Tato Mabana's gross income. So, should Miriam include this in her gross income, or should Tato include this in, um, in her gross income? It goes back to that services rendered thing, right? Would Miriam get the bursary if Tato was not employed at Tulani? No. So, the reason uh, Miriam got the uh, bursary is because Tato is rendering services at Tulani traders, something like that, right? So, it's included in Tato Mabana's gross income as per services rendered. I don't know if you've ever filled bursary applications. You'll see that they usually ask you, do you have a relative working at the company? Have you ever guys noticed that? And then you have to disclose no or, or yes. It's for tax purposes because then if, if you have someone working there, then it complicates things, right? Okay. And it's how much do we include? 50,000, right? Okay. And then is it exempt? Yes. Why? Hey, where was I? Okay, um, guys, I advise you to do this. Um, like I said, remember, your objective is to earn marks. Whenever you sit down for an assessment, you are not there to play games. You are there to earn marks, right? So what this means is, when you are preparing, even now, starting today, when you are preparing for 30 May, the test on 30 May, you should make sure most bulk of your activity is anchored at assessing your ability to essentially add marks. What this means is, guys, I've noticed there's a habit. Most of you guys like to rewrite the textbook where you say, okay, I, I, I can only understand it if I write the notes myself. And then you find yourself literally writing silk on a for choir book or on Word document. And by the end of the year, you are sitting with 100 pages of silk, which you already have and have bought, bought with uh, valued money. To save time, I thing you should follow the what essentially prof pedak has taught you do mind maps like do mind maps and then in your mind maps you can reference the silk pages so that if you forgot what you essentially wrote on your mind map then you can quickly read through it in the textbook do you guys understand instead of just rewriting notes and then and remember after you write those notes you have to study them again so you are you are investing double the effort for essentially 100% of the result. You are putting in 200% and you are probably getting out even less than 100. Probably getting out 50%. And then it takes, it takes away time from you to practice questions and essentially assess your ability to earn marks. Do you guys understand? So, don't become a publisher at the end of the year and you are busy sending notes <laughs> of essentially copyrighted material. Okay, so let's go through it. Is the bursary or scholarship a bona fide or bona fide bursary or scholarship? Yes, it is because it's given to for Miriam to essentially study, right? So we go to yes, and then was the bursary granted to enable a person to study at a recognized edu educational or research institution? Yes, it was because they tell us here yeah, uh, for Miriam to study a diploma at a recognized institution, right? And then we move on from that yes to um, was the bursary granted by an employer? Yes, it was. It was granted by Tulani to an employee or relative. It was granted to Miriam, who is a relative, right? So it was given to 
um, so we say yes. And then we go, well, the bursary or scholarship granted to a relative of an employee? And then the answer is yes. And then we come here. What this means, guys, is if the bursary is given to the employee itself, you do not have to determine the remuneration proxy. Do you guys understand? Because if you say, was the bursary or scholarship granted to a relative of an employee, and then you say no, it was only given to the employee himself, then you, straight, you come here now, and then you, you have to determine, okay, which NQF level. Right. And then, but yeah, if, if they say, if the answer is yes, then the bursary is not exempt. Meaning, if it's given to the employee, yeah, let me correct myself. If it's given to the employee, then it's not exempt. Do you guys understand? Yes, ma'am. Yes, so if the bursary was given to Tato herself, then it would not be exempt because you say, was the bursary granted to an employee or a relative? Then you say, yes, it was granted to an employee or relative, and then it gets more specific. And then you have to answer, was the bursary or scholarship granted to a relative of an employee? And then your answer would be no. And then you'd come uh, uh, to a relative, and then, and then your answer would be no, and then you'd come here, and then you'd say, the bursary or scholarship is not exempt. Am I understanding this correct? Why am I so? Yeah, that's the flow. Yeah, that's the flow. And then you have to, and then you come here. Yeah. If you say, was the bursary or scholarship granted to a relative of an employee? If your answer then now is yes, it was granted to a relative of an employee. Yes, ma'am. Yeah? Okay, this is the old test. 2022 textbook. On 2022, it's 107. And I think on um, the new one as well, it's 107. Yeah. Uh, so, if it's given to a relative, which is the daughter of um, Miriam, uh, yo, daughter of Tato, Miriam, and then you ask, and then only then you calculate the remuneration proxy. And then you ask yourself, did the employee's remuneration proxy for the year of assessment exceed 600,000 or was remuneration sacrifice to obtain the scholarship of bursary so she did not sacrifice her uh, thing her, her, her remuneration then now we have to determine whether or not her uh, thingy her remuneration proxy exceeds 600,000 so remember we already told there that uh, she started working at uh, at Tulani on 1 December 2021 so she started working in the 2022 year of assessment. You guys catch that, right? And then in terms of your notes there, let's quickly go to your notes. Yeah, I think time is showing me. Let me try and be fast. In terms of your slides, uh, let's go to your slides. So in terms of your slides, um, let me see. Uh, in terms of your slides, for remuneration proxy or for the remuneration proxy calculation, you first determine was this person fully employed in the prior year. If that's the case, you take the salary or the remuneration package of the current of the prior year. As it is, you don't do anything with it, right? If the person was partly employed in the prior year, which happens to be the case because Tato only started working on 1 December 2021, right? And then you'd apply this option. However, if the person only started working in the current year of assessment, then you'd apply the third option, which is to just take the first uh, salary they earned and you divide it by the number of days in that month they started working in, then you annualize it by multiplying it by 365. But currently, we are here, guys, right? 
who has just only started working uh, in, 20, in the 2022 year of assessment. So this is how you calculate your remuneration proxy. You first say 24,000, because we are told she earned 24,000 rents per month, and you multiply it by the number of months she worked in the prior year, which is three months, right? And then you divide that by the total number of days she worked in the prior year. It was 31 days for December, plus 31 days for January, plus 28 days for February, right? And then that was that. And then you multiply this by 365 days. And then you get a remuneration proxy of 292,000. Do you guys understand? Okay. And then is this a... Yes, ma'am. Can I? Okay. Is 292,000 guys uh, above or more than 600,000? Yeah, but some of you guys in test, you. <laughs> I've seen this happen. In test one, people were saying 618 is more than 915. I'm like, wow, guys. <laughs> the pressure must have been too much. So, yeah, it's not. So, therefore, are you cool or are you still copying the calculation? But it's literally this slide. Um, rather, don't copy the calculation. Just learn the, like, from the slides itself. You take the total prior year amount, which is the salary per month multiplied by whichever number of months she worked in the prior year. And then you determine the total number of days she worked in the prior year. You get the salary per day, right? And then you annualize that by multiplying it by 365 days. That's what it is to get a, an approximation of what she could have earned or would have earned if she worked, the full, um, she worked for the full prior year of assessment, right? And then let's um, go come here. Okay, so um, so her salary thingy, her remuneration proxy is not in excess, so it's not above 600,000. If it was 700,000, for example, then the bursary would not be exempt. You guys understand? Same as here, if the bursary is, given, is not given to a relative, then it is not exempt. I don't want to see what it says above here. Then you, are, you would apply this, you see. Oh, okay, okay. Stand to be corrected, guys. I didn't see this part. Then it says, the bursary granted to an employee, right? And then you say, did the employee agree to reimburse the employer if he failed to complete his studies for reasons other than death, ill health, or injury? If that's the case, and then the bursary or scholarship is exempt in terms of that. But yeah, just take time to learn this section. Yo, low shading, ne? Yo, okay. Uh, but yeah, we're done with that. Okay, so we agree that the... Oh, I moved too fast. But let's continue for the sake. Okay, guys, I don't know if you have your silk in front of you, but if you look at that uh, thing, so we have a bona fide, uh, bona fide bursary. Yeah, this is gonna take time, yeah. And uh, it was given for Miriam to study a diploma at a recognized institution, and uh, it was awarded to a relative, which is Miriam Tato's daughter. And Miriam and Tato's remuneration proxy is less than 600,000. And then after that, we are told that she'll be getting NQF level 4. And then you'll see they split into three. You first have essentially basic education, grade R to grade 12. And then there's a specific amount which is assigned for that exemption. And then you have NQF level 1 up until level 4. And then there's a specific amount that is assigned for that exemption. Then you have NQF level 5 up until 10. And I believe you guys are either at 8 or 7. I'm not sure what an undergrad degree is. Right. Uh, so for Miriam, it's level 4. It's a diploma. It's not a degree. So, and she's disabled, right? Another thing, last thing to take care of is you must take note of whether the taxpayer is not disabled or if the taxpayer is disabled. In this case, Miriam is disabled. So it's 30,000 rands. Do you guys agree? 
but it's weird just talking to you guys without something, without showing you anything. But hey, what can we do, guys? Okay, it looks like it's you. Okay, I don't know. Uh, okay. And then we are told, moving on, we are told that um, and then we are told that uh, Miriam received a uniform allowance. Yeah, guys, I think this is why it's important to bring the question so that you, at least you see what I'm talking about. You are told that you, Miriam, received a uniform allowance of 2,000 rands for the year to buy formal black pants, right? And then all employees are obliged to wear these pants to work. Is this gross income? Yes, it is, right? And it's 2,000 and it's a fringe benefit. So you'd write there, uniform, fringe benefit, or paragraph I of um, special inclusions, and it include 2,000 rands. Then my question to you guys is this, is it exempt? It is, right? All the yeas, the nays, okay, those who say no, why? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's normal black pants, meaning it's not clearly distinguishable. Yeah, I don't know why this projector is slowing me down. But if you look at your slides, you will see there, the, the employee must be obliged to wear the uniform. And secondly, and it's an end test and you must meet all these requirements, the uniform must be clearly distinguishable, right? Meaning if it's not clearly distinguishable, like you said, it's normal black pants, which you can wear anywhere, then it, you would not uh, get the exemption. So the uniform is not exempt because uh, not clearly distinguishable. Yeah, guys, these projectors, I don't know why, they take time to, I don't know, to start again after, like, uh, power interruptions. Yeah, okay, it's coming back on, at least. Okay, so for the uniform exemption, it's not exempt. Some time. Okay, cool. Yeah, hey guys, we're back. Okay, so just to go over again, um, let me start here. It's NQF level four, right? If you remember on the bursary, NQF level one to four. But the main thing to take note of here is this, guys. There are different amounts for people who are not disabled and different amounts for those who are disabled. And then, yeah, as long as you know the NQF for the person, then if they are disabled, you will take the 30,000. Like they said, they told us here that Miriam is considered disabled, right? Okay. And then for the uniform, it's formal black pants. And as per your slides, let me show you slides. As per your slides, you'll see. Yeah, you see? Uh, it says uniform must be clearly distinguishable from ordinary clothing. So it's like those, I don't know if you've seen someone who's working in a lab and then they wear those gears. You cannot go out and party in that unless, I don't know, you're, like you're really serious about partying in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in lab equipment. Uh, but like normal clothing, like formal black pants, that's not clearly distinguishable from ordinary clothing. So therefore you would not qualify for the exemption. 
Oh, okay, so that's why we have a zero there. And then let's continue. We are told that Tato also received the following amounts during a 2023 of assessment. The key thing here is that these are amounts received outside of employment. So we are told she received a lump sum of 504,000 rands uh, as an inheritance from her late mother on 15 March 2022, which Tato invested in a tax-free investment. So she invested this in a tax-free investment. My question to you guys is this, is this gross income? Don't be shy guys. Is that amount, is the 504,000 rands gross income? Total amount, 504,000 in cash or otherwise is cash, 504,000 um, received by, is received by Tato during the year of assessment, 15 March 2022, that's in the current year of assessment. And then uh, it says excluding receipts of a capital nature. My question to you is this now, is this capital in nature or is it not? Hey, you guys. <laughs> uh, okay. Please, guys, befriend this document right here. Whenever you are practicing your gross income questions, especially discussion questions. Uh, when you are doing your gross income discussion questions, I want to find where it is now. When you are doing your gross income discussion question, please always have this in front of you so that you can essentially pick these things up, like know how to apply your court cases. So we've met all these other requirements, right? Our question is this, is the 504,000 rands um, capital in nature? I'll ask you guys this, in terms of continuity of activities, do we expect her mother to resurrect and die again? We don't, right? You only die once, YOLO. <laughs> right. So in terms of continuity of activities, when you're applying your subjective uh, test or ob objective test, it's a once-off event, right? It's an inheritance. So what, is that, what does that indicate? It's capital in nature, right? It goes back to that whole thing about where you have someone who is a professional gambler, this person lives in the casino, right? And they have probabilities or a system that they are using to earn a living from uh, their gambling operations to a group of students celebrating maybe graduation or someone celebrating their birthday and they go to the casino and they get lucky and they hit jackpot. So in terms of the guy who just went once and hit jackpot, it's capital in nature, right? But in terms of the guy who frequently does this, it's gross income. You guys understand? It's that whole thing. It's an inheritance, so once of thing. We die once, guys, and maybe we resurrect, who knows? So the lump sum is capital in nature and it's not gross income. Do you guys agree? Lump sum, capital, and then we'll include it at zero, right? And then, yeah, let's quickly move. And then local dividends of 4,000 rands, and these dividends are paid as an annuity. Are the dividends gross income? They are, right? I'm not sure, but I think it's the general definition. Are they exempt? No, right? Why? Because it's an annuity, right? And then we quickly move on. Oh, guys, please, please, please. Guys, please note this. You always include an amount in gross income first before you exempt it. You don't just exempt it. Because now you are creating a negative effect on income. You are decreasing the income. And you don't just show zero by essentially not showing the inclusion and the deduction. You must show the inclusion first and show the deduction. Otherwise, you are limiting your ability to earn marks, even though I can tell you understand. Uh, okay. And then we have interest of 35,000 rands, and it's from a tax-free investment, right? And then we have another interest of 35,000 rands, but this one is from her bank. Right. Is it gross income? Is the interest gross income? Yes, right? In terms of the general definition of gross income. 
it's 70,000, 35,000 plus 35,000, right? And you'll show that calculation. And then is the interest exempt? Hey guys, it is exempt, right? How much is exempt? Okay, okay, the main thing to watch out for here is this, guys. You have interest from a tax-free investment account and you have interest from a local bank account. And in terms of exemptions, there are different provisions, right? You cannot, you must exempt each as per each provision. For TFSAs or tax-free savings accounts, the full return on this, on the capital invested therein is exempt, you guys agree? So for that interest, for that interest from a TFSA or Section 12 cap T, you deduct the full 35,000 rands. But what about the interest from the local bank? Remember they told us that Tato is 65 years old, right? So that means she, is a, she will exempt her interest at 34,500 rands. If she was younger than 65, then it would be minus 23,800 rands. If the interest, for instance, was maybe 20,000, and she's still entitled to the minus 34,500, you would then limit it to the 20,000. Do you guys agree? Because you do not create a negative effect on income by simply exempting an amount. Exempting means the amount has a nil effect on income, and by income, I mean gross income less exempt income. Right. And then the 5,000 rands alimony, is that uh, gross income, guys? In terms of what's the reason? Maintenance, right? And then, is it exempt? Yeah? It is, guys. It is exempt. I forgot the specific provision. But it's exempt. You can look on your silk index. You will see it's exempt. Um, so we are told Tato also inherited a house. Right. So Tato inherited a house from her late mother. She decided to rent out the house to LSC. So she's renting out the house to LSC. So in terms of this, first of all, you have to determine, because remember the gross income definition says total amount. The total amount here, we don't know. They didn't give us the house, the house value. Then they say in cash or otherwise. So even though she did not receive cash, she received a house. So it meets the otherwise definition. And then you'd go on further, but essentially you'd have to determine whether or not this um, house or this receipt is capital in nature. And in terms of de determining that, you see, it says here in terms of SR, income is what capital produces. We are told that she will list the house. So the house is the tree or the capital, and the rent income from the house would then be the fruit. In terms of another thing, again, like we said, it's a once-off thing. The event which led to her inheriting the house, is, it's a once-off thing. Her mother passed away. So it's cut the house or the inheritance of the house is capital in nature. And then you'd include at zero, right? <clears throat> and then the last item, guys. We are told, however, the house needed some repairs. So the house needs repairs. Right. She signed a contract. So she signed a contract. Very important. On 1 December 2022. So meaning within the current year of assessment. With the lessee, that's the that the lessee will do the repairs for 50,000 rands. So the lessee will do the repairs for 50,000 rands. The repairs were done on 1 March 2023. My question to you guys, is this a receipt in, term, in Tato's hands? Print in perspective, she inherited a house. But the house, before she could rent it out, she had to do repairs worth 50,000 rands. She then entered into a contract with the lessee, and the contract stated that the lessee has to do the repairs. They signed the contract on 1 December 2022, meaning in the 2023 year of assessment, and the repairs, however, were only done on 1 March 2023, meaning in the 2024 year of assessment. And remember, in terms of our required, we are only dealing with the 2023 year of assessment. 
So in terms of the GI definition, okay, first of all, these are repairs, right? Not improvements. So they don't meet the paragraph H, leasehold improvements. You guys agree? So we do not meet any of the special inclusions paragraphs. In terms of the general definition of gross income, uh, we have to determine, okay, what's the total amount? That's 50,000 rands, right? Is it in cash or otherwise? Hey, guys. Is the 50,000 rands worth of repairs in cash or otherwise? Don't be shy, guys. Did Miriam get cash? No, she got a benefit in terms of the lessee doing the repairs which she would have done. So it's otherwise. Is it received by, in favor of, or accrued to Miriam? It's in favor of Miriam, right? Because she's now benefiting by not doing, she's saving cash by not doing the repairs. Do you guys agree? Okay, and then uh, now we have to determine, okay, during the year of assessment, now we have to determine, okay, which is earlier? Is the receipt earlier or is the accrual earlier? Accrual, right? Because they signed a contract on 1 December 2022. So meaning, if this guy doesn't comply with the contractual uh, terms, then Miri or Tato, sorry, Tato can sue, right? So it's accrued at, at on 50 on 1 December 2022. And then is it capital in nature? No, it's a repair, right? It doesn't create an enduring benefit. So is it gross income? Yes, right? But yeah, in terms of the formal solution, uh, it's, they say it's, uh, since it's not improvements, then it's not gross income because it doesn't meet paragraph H. But I had a talk about this with various people in the, in the department. Well, we, we had discussions even last year, but today they agreed that it's gross income. So you'd include the repairs as gross income at 50,000 rands. Uh, and that's the tutorial, guys. But before you go, any questions, first of all? I'll upload the scenario, uh, sorry. I'll upload the solution on ClickUp. Any questions? Okay, uh, and here is the, before you go. Okay. Please sign the register, guys. Please sign the register, guys. Uh, is it too big or too small? Eh? Small. And then if you don't have a device, you can come to me. I'll take down your name. If you don't have a device guys please come to me we'll take down your name and yeah i'll record you manually